few times every year, someone walks up to me and says, I was reading Linux man pages and I saw your name. Are you that David McKenzie? Yes, I am. Since there's some interest in how I became involved in Linux and Unix at a pivotal time in their development, I thought I'd tell the story. Along the way, I'll give an idea of what computing was like over the last 40 years. This video contains a lot of edits. That's because it wasn't scripted. I did brain dumps on video and then spliced them together. It begins as it does for a lot of people with video games. I grew up when home video game systems were just becoming popular. My parents gave me an Atari video computer system for Christmas. Some of my friends got one also and we spent many hours playing video games on our Atari VCS systems using joysticks that looked a lot like this, modern reproduction. It saved us a lot of time and money at the arcades. A year or two later, some of my friends started getting home computers like the Apple II, TRS-80, and Atari 800. Eventually, my brother got a Commodore 64. But before we had that, we discovered that my middle school had one computer in the math lab. My math teacher offered an after-school class for anyone interested in learning how to program it. Several of my friends and I took the class and learned some basic programming. And we started to be able to create our own video games. And soon we learned 6502 assembly language as well to make the games much faster. The computer was an Ohio Scientific Challenger 2P, which was an obscure model. It used a cassette tape for storing programs. In high school, the math lab had two Ohio Scientific computers. One of them was a Challenger 3, which had two floppy disk drives and more memory. It only had a serial terminal, so it didn't have the fast memory mapped graphics that the other Challenger did. But it gave us the opportunity to improve the operating system decompiling the Microsoft BASIC interpreter and adding our own commands. Ken Lorber was a mentor to me during high school. He was a senior when I was a freshman, and since he'd had several years of experience with the Challenger 3, he got me started and set an example of hacking the operating system to improve it for everyone using it. Decades later, I ran into Ken again several times, once at a Usenix conference in San Diego when he was working for America Online, and a few years after that, at a reunion of a high school club. He still had a catalog of Ohio Scientific products from the time we were in high school. Ken Lorber added a command to renumber basic programs, and I added some commands to do things like list the files on the floppy disk, making a, a primitive disk operating system. We had to hand disassemble the Microsoft BASIC interpreter by printing it out and marking up these long printouts with a pencil as we gradually figured out what different routines did and where we could hook in to our, add our own code. The other Challenger computer it was a Challenger 2P. That had less memory but it had some graphical characters which could be used for producing video games, including the front and rear halves of the Starship Enterprise facing both directions. So I made a Star Trek game in which you fly the Enterprise around and shoot aliens. When my brother Matthew got his Commodore 64, we got a floppy disk drive with it and an Epson FX80 printer and we learned how to program that computer as well. We created some optimizations to how it accessed the floppy drive, which had its own CPU in it. Our high school had several computer clubs started by students. One general interest computer club, which I was the president of one year, and special interest clubs for owners of Apple, 
Commodore and other brands of computers. Every spring, our high school has a festival of the arts. It's mainly to showcase the fine arts creations of the students from the year, but for several years in the 1980s, the computer clubs were given permission to set up tables and bring in computers and create a mini arcade at one end of the Festival of the Arts. This is a picture I took in 1985 of the Commodore 64 users group. We would set up video games running on the computers, some of which we'd written and some of which we'd purchased. We had little coin boxes so that people could pay 10 cents to play a game and it was a bit of a fundraising activity for our clubs and it was also fun to see people actually enjoying playing the games that we had created. After high school I lost interest in video games and I pursued more the operating systems direction. My brother Matthew became a professional video game programmer for decades after that so we each took one branch of the interests that we'd had during high school. The first time I ever saw a multi-user computer system was in 1981 when my dad gave my mom and my brother and I a tour of his office at the President's Council on Environmental Quality in the new Executive Office Building in Washington, D.C. This looks like a DEC VT100 terminal that was connected to their word processor, although that didn't mean anything to me at the time. In 1985, I started at St. Olaf College in Northfield, Minnesota. That was my first introduction to Unix. The college had a DEC VAX 11780 running 4.2 BSD Unix, a PDP 1170 running Unix version 7 with some BSD features backported to it, and a PDP 1184 running 2.9 BSD. This is the server room in the Science Center at St. Olaf College. The VAX 11780 is on the right behind the laser printer and the line printers. The PDP 1170 and PDP 1184 are off to the left behind the partition. You can also see the nine track magnetic tapes we used for backups. This was the first laser printer I'd ever seen. It was made by Imogen it didn't use PostScript, it had its own markup language. Using the line printers was free, but there was a small per page charge for using the laser printer. It was much more expensive to operate. The output sure looked a lot better though. There were Zenith Z29 and Z19 serial terminals scattered throughout the campus, including dorms, the library, and some of the classroom buildings. Those were running at 2400 bits per second, so it was like a modem connection no matter where you went, except they were hardwired serial lines that ran all the way back to the Science Center where the computers were. St. Olaf's Academic Computing Center had typeset Unix manuals available for purchase. You couldn't read them electronically, but you could buy the printouts, so I bought the whole set and pretty much memorized them. I went through the alphabetical list of Unix commands in the manual, trying each one to see what it did. When I got to the letter S, I saw the SU command, which said, become the super user. Super user? I wonder what that is. So I ran it, and it asked me for a password. Of course, I didn't have a password for it. So I went on to the next command. A few minutes later, someone came running into the room and asked, Are you David McKenzie? Yes. Why? Don't ever run that SU command again. Okay. As the school year went on, however, I learned C programming from the classic Kernahan and Ritchie book and got hired as a student systems programmer and then I legitimately did have access to use the SU command and knew what the root account was. 
Ironically, several years later, I wrote the GNU SU command for Linux. Parts of that code are still in use today, although it has been modified by other people. The first time I re-implemented any Unix utilities was actually for MS-DOS. When I was at St. Olaf, I got spoiled by Unix and having to come home to a DOS PC with two floppy drives during breaks was a disappointment. I missed the Unix utilities, so I used Turbo C to create my own partial implementations of some of the core utilities like LS, and RM, and CAT. I put them in the public domain and distributed them on bulletin board systems under the name Unix PG. They didn't have all the features of the Unix, especially the Berkeley versions, but I liked them a lot better than the very bare-bones MS-DOS commands. In the summer of 1987, I stayed in Minnesota to work as a full-time programmer for St. Olaf College. I added the Kermit file transfer protocol to a terminal emulation program for MS-DOS that had been written at St. Olaf. And I also helped with upgrading the VAX from 4.2 to 4.3 BSD Unix. We had to recompile all the applications that were running on it. And some of those applications needed modification because of local customizations we'd made to 4.2, like adding support for non-English characters to allow students to edit documents in other languages. So for a few weeks, we would bounce back and forth between running 4.2 and 4.3 on the VAX until we had everything working again in time for the fall semester when the students returned. In 1987, St. Olaf purchased several Sun workstations running SunOS, which was a derivative of BSD Unix. They used the SunView windowing system. X11 was also available, but there were no good window managers or client applications available for X yet, so we used SunView. Those suns were the first Unix graphical workstations I ever saw. One of the other student programmers in the summer of 1987 was my friend Mike Hartel, with whom I shared an apartment in Northfield. Mike got copies of GNU Emacs and GCC and installed them, and arranged to get an internship the next summer with the Free Software Foundation in Cambridge. He also got me a login on the GNU Project computers at MIT. I started looking around the GNU source code, which was using the RCS source code control system at that time, and I found several incomplete utilities re-implementing Unix commands. I started finishing them and writing others that hadn't been started yet to create a complete Unix compatible operating system. Unix was a closed source product. A source code license would cost tens of thousands of dollars and only universities, research labs, and the government had access to the source code. Richard Stallman wanted to create a complete free operating system that anyone could learn from and improve and share. So we had to start over, and Unix was a reasonably good starting point for a design. But we never felt limited by Unix compatibility. GNU was supposed to be better as well. One of the guidelines for GNU software was no arbitrary limits. The Unix commands had been written a decade earlier on much more limited computers, but by the time of 32-bit virtual memory machines, things like hard-coded buffer sizes were no longer necessary. We also tried to improve the performance and add additional convenience functions wherever we could compared to the Unix versions. Some of our improvements later made their way into the Unix and BSD versions of those commands. My friend Mike wrote the GNU versions of diff, grep, and several other programs using innovative algorithms that significantly outperformed the Unix counterparts. The GNU coding standards also set a high bar for documentation using a tech macro package called techinfo. It combined a tutorial with a reference section in the back resulting in documentation that was suitable both for beginners and advanced users. Unfortunately, the TechInfo format never fully caught on, and the GNU project had to add 
Unix style man pages as well for backward compatibility. But those never contained all the content of the tech info manuals. And many people who use Linux now are missing out on the best documentation for the software when they only read the man pages. The tech info format predated the World Wide Web in its use of hypertext. The idea was for the entire documentation for the system to be one hypertext document with links between the manuals for the different components. Maybe it was just ahead of its time. Source code contributed to the GNU project was reviewed for adherence to the GNU coding standards. Things like meaningful variable names, documentation comments that specified what the function was for and what the parameters were. Readability and maintainability were valued since potentially many people would be looking at the code. The lessons learned from Richard Stallman and the GNU coding standards have stayed with me and affected everything I've done since. After two years at St. Olaf, I came back home to Maryland. I'd gotten more interested in computer programming than I was in my studies, and you couldn't major in computer science at St. Olaf. I got a job in Washington, D.C. at the Environmental Defense Fund as an administrative assistant doing photocopying, filing, mailings, things like that. But soon they found out that I knew more about their computer systems than they did and they started adding some system administration responsibilities to my job. Their main computer was a Charles River Data Systems Universe 68T, which was a Motorola 68000 based computer running a sort of Unix-like operating system called UNOS. It had a lot of incompatibilities with Unix and a lot of limitations that annoyed me after using Berkeley Unix at St. Olaf. So I started porting the unreleased GNU utilities to UNOS so we could run proper Unix shell scripts on it. EDF also had an office in Berkeley, so they were interested in better Unix compatibility as well. And they let me spend part of my time there working on the GNU utilities and donating them to the Free Software Foundation so that they could benefit from them as well. This is one of my desks at EDF with the WISE 50 terminal that was our standard throughout the office. As I got a group of command line utilities finished, I packaged it up and released it as the file utils on the GNU project's FTP server. Then I continued on filling in gaps and released the text utils and shell utils Eventually, those three were all wrapped up as the core utils, but in the early 90s, I kept them separate because the sizes of the source distributions were a concern, and people would complain if they had to download a lot more data than they needed. If they only wanted a new version of LS or CAT, they didn't want to download a file that was three times as large and have to compile it all. Later on, as computers got faster, network connections got faster, and disks got bigger. That stopped being a concern. In the summers of 1991 and 1992, Richard Stallman hired me as a full-time programmer in between my college studies. He had several summer student programmers working for the Free Software Foundation full-time to complete various projects. He'd seen the work that I was doing as a volunteer and was happy to get more of my time. I worked primarily from home or the University of Maryland, but I did travel up to Cambridge, Massachusetts, where the MIT AI lab is, for a week here and there to meet the other GNU programmers in person. While I was in Cambridge, I either brought a sleeping bag and slept on the floors of the FSF offices or stayed with one of my cousins who lives there. I grew up not far from there, so it's fun to return now and then. In the Free Software Foundation offices at MIT, I remember walking past a 386 desktop PC with the lid off, sitting on a table, and someone told me, oh, that's the herd development machine. It looked awfully modest to me. In 1990, Richard Stallman was given a MacArthur Foundation Genius Award, 
And one of the first things he did with the money he received was to buy a stereo for the office of the programmers who worked for him. So two of the other GNU programmers, Mike Bushnell, who now goes by Thomas Bushnell, and Roland McGrath and I got on the tee, took the Green Line trolley to Leachmere Sales, which is a store kind of like Best Buy now, and we picked out a stereo and carried it back on the tee and set it up in the office. I admired Richard for thinking of others first. He really has given his life to making the world a better place for other people as he sees it. I admire that about him. Another person who was often in the FSF offices was Charles Hannum, who later became one of the founders of the NetBSD project. In the early 1990s, work was underway to make a complete free BSD Unix distribution that didn't include any of the proprietary AT&T source code. However, there was a legal cloud over the effort for several years as AT&T sued BSDI, claiming that BSD still included some of the AT&T code without permission. This uncertainty about the legal status of BSD happened right around the time that Linux became available and allowed the upstart operating system to begin to take market share and developer mind share and become a popular platform. In 1989, I returned to school, but at the University of Maryland to get a computer science degree. I was hired by the university's College of Engineering as a system administrator and student programmer. There I met several people that I would work with later at UUNet and other companies, including Kurt Lytle, Dave Sue, Josh Osborne, and Chris Ross. This was our shared office called the Hacker's Pit. At the University of Maryland, Chris Ross and I took an operating systems class where we had to build a toy operating system that ran on the original IBM PC compatible hardware in 16-bit mode and was a cooperative multitasking text windowing system. The applications had to be compiled into the OS because there were no mass storage drivers, but it did have keyboard and screen drivers and it could run several programs at once displaying into different text windows. As we often did, Chris and I went above and beyond the assignment. We were required to get the caps lock key working, but the assignment didn't say anything about the little light that indicates whether caps lock is on or off. Not having that working bugged us so much that we figured out how to get the light to turn on and off and added code to do that. This is me checking my email at the University of Maryland one last time on graduation day in the new hacker's pit. I'm reading my email through GNU Emacs. Back then, most email was plain text, not HTML with images in it. In the early 1990s, the IEEE was defining the POSIX standards for Unix compatible operating systems. Since Richard Stallman was on the POSIX committee, the GNU project had input into the drafts before the standards were finalized, and Richard delegated commenting on the drafts to the FSF staff members who had contributed to those parts of the system. So I got to review the Shell and Utilities standard, POSIX.2, along with the bash maintainers. That led to a few phone calls with Keith Bostick from Berkeley, who was editing the standard, to talk over my proposed changes. A few of them got accepted. Keith talked me out of a lot of them, having had more experience than me. Keith was simultaneously overseeing the re-implementation of the utilities for BSD, and the BSD and GNU versions ended up cross-pollinating, adopting some of the enhancements that each other had added. Before complete GNU Linux systems existed, we had to bootstrap development of the utilities on existing Unix systems. There were a variety of these, including BSD, Unix System 5, SEO Unix and Xenix, Charles River Data Systems, UNOS, SunOS, Ultrix, IBM AIX. Each of these Unix variants had a different set of features which had to be configured by editing make files, 
and C header files. Doing this got tiring pretty quickly. It occurred to me that a computer ought to be able to figure this stuff out. A shell script could just look around the system, maybe compile some test programs and figure out what the system had and edit the configuration files all on its own. And so I started writing configure shell scripts to do that. Before long I had several of these scripts, each tailored to the different packages I was maintaining. And every time I made an improvement to the techniques, I'd have to backport it to all of them. And it occurred to me, a computer ought to be able to do that too. And so going up one level of meta, I started to create a configure script generator. Originally it was going to be called autoconfig, but the old Unix file system had a 14 character limit and autoconfig plus a version number plus tar plus maybe dot z didn't all fit in 14 characters. So I had to shorten the name to autoconf. Many people are aware of the MS-DOS 8.3 character file name limitation, but not as many people remember that Unix had a 14 character limit for over a decade. When I was a system administrator at St. Olaf and the University of Maryland, we used the Unix M4 macroprocessor to create customized configuration files for SendMail, Kerberos, password and group files, particularly at the University of Maryland where the group I was in called Project Glue was responsible for several different departments of the College of Engineering, each of which needed its own configuration. So since I was familiar with M4, I decided to give it a try for creating the configure scripts as well. Eventually, I started hitting bugs and hard-coded limits in the Unix versions of M4, and I had to start requiring the GNU M4. If I had to do it all again, I would have preferred to do probably an object-oriented design in Python to do the configuration, but that wasn't part of the base operating system anywhere at the time and it would have been a big download to require. Most people were still using modems at the time to dial up to the internet and requiring large downloads in order to compile a source code package was just not acceptable. Perl would have been another option, but that wasn't included in any operating system at the time either. So shell scripts it was. In 1993, I got a job working for Cygnus Support which was the first company to provide commercial support and development for free software. They later changed their name to Cygnus Solutions, then got acquired by Red Hat, which got acquired by IBM. But it was a fairly small company when I worked there. I spent the summer of 1993 at the Cygnus headquarters in Mountain View, California, living in a company apartment in Palo Alto just a bike ride away from the Stanford University campus. My main responsibilities were working on the GNU linker and bin utils, but I also developed a side project. Cygnus had created some configure shell scripts for their compiler tool chains to allow them to cross compile to different target architectures. These were handwritten, but they were similar to the configure scripts generated by autoconf version one for the utilities in many ways. I decided at that point it made sense to merge the two efforts and take the best ideas from both. And so I spent part of the summer creating AutoConf version two, which supported cross compilation as well as automatic detection of system features. AutoConf turned out to solve a problem that many other developers faced as well and it became the de facto standard for configuring not just GNU software, but most of the open source software written for Unix type systems over the next 20 years. I didn't take many photos in the 1990s, which I regret. This is the only picture I took of the Cygnus support office. My desk was in the middle of that cubicle farm behind the partition in the middle of the photo. The spark station on my desk was named The Pub by Steve Chamberlain, the British software developer who had used it before me. He was the initial author of the GNU Linker, which I was taking over. I'd never been to a pub at that point. I did make it to one in London a couple of years later, but 
That's not a name I would have chosen, but I was stuck with it. This is the Cygnus Support Company mug. I used to do a lot of my work on printouts with a pencil or a pen. In high school, we had a, a dot matrix printer with uh, a continuous roll of paper or fan fold paper where the pages were attached. So you could print something out and kind of like a scroll, just open it up and stretch it out for many feet and then it would make a pile. Assembly language code takes a, a lot of lines because each instruction is on its own line and doesn't do very much. So I had some very long printouts to look through as I was reverse engineering and decompiling that code. Then in the 1990s, working for the GNU project, I didn't have a laptop, but I did take printouts of some code I was working on with me on vacation with my family. As my parents were driving us around between national parks out in the western United States, I'd be sitting in the back seat with a printout. For example, the public domain fast find code, which uh, became the locate command. I started with that. It, it wasn't especially well engineered or commented. Well, it wasn't 8-bit clean. You couldn't, you couldn't store Unicode characters in it, only 7-bit ASCII. That was an optimization to reduce the size of the locate database. So I had to understand that code and then refactor and rewrite it to make it portable. Also, it depended on the host byte ordering. You couldn't put a locate database on an NFS share and share it between computers that had different byte ordering, which is something I needed to do sometimes. In the summer of 1993, when I was working at Cygnus, I took a day trip to Berkeley to visit the offices of the Computer Science Research Group, which had developed Berkeley Unix. By that time, there was no one regularly working there. The developers had either gone off to other jobs or were working from home, but the offices were still there. I found the building and the room. They had the whiteboards and bookshelves and desks. It felt a bit like a pilgrimage to an ancient monument that had been preserved. I was glad I went when I did before the offices had been emptied out and used for something else. The software development experience was rather different in the late 80s and early 90s than it is today. Frequently, there was no graphical windowing system involved. If we needed multiple terminals, we would use a tool like the Screen Program, or else GNU Emacs, which also allowed you to split a text window. One advantage of using Screen is that it could save your session if the modem disconnected, which it might, especially if you were sharing your phone line with somebody who wanted to make a phone call. So many of us would have screen sessions on dial-up connections that lasted for days. Watching code compile was also more of an ordeal back then. With processor speeds well below 100 megahertz, when you ran a make on a project like GNU Emacs, you could watch each line of code compile. It might take several seconds. I remember when the University of Maryland got its first Spark stations in, it was amazing to see the lines of make output scroll by faster than I could actually read them. And there were really no integrated development environments. Pretty much everyone used either Emacs or more likely VI, not Vim, the original Berkeley VI written by Bill Joy. And Emacs was kind of a luxury because of how much memory it took. There was a joke that it was actually an acronym for eight megs and constantly swapping because most workstations had at most eight megabytes of RAM back then. The Sun 350 had only four. So a fully configured Emacs could often use the majority of the RAM on the system. 
kind of like the web browsers of today, which are often larger than the operating systems they run on. Now Emacs seems moderately sized compared to today's development environments. Some developers, like Linus Torvalds, chose to use micro Emacs or other partial implementations of Emacs that used a lot less memory and weren't as programmable. I used micro Emacs for a while, especially on the UNOS system at EDF, where GNU Emacs just wouldn't fit. Long before the days of SourceForge, GitHub, and other networked source code hosting platforms, each developer had their own source code repository. If someone wanted to contribute patches to a project, they would email them to a mailing list or a maintainer who would apply them or modify them to their copy of the source code repository. The work in progress code, the head or main branch, wasn't visible to anyone else until a release was done, perhaps an alpha or beta. You couldn't do a pull and submit patches that way or follow progress that was ongoing unless you were one of the maintainers who had access to the source code. More recent tools such as Git and Mercurial are a big step up in usability and efficiency. The first time I saw an actual running Linux system was in the summer of 1993 when I was working for Cygnus. One of the staff members got Linux installed on his laptop. The first time I started using Linux personally was after attending a, a conference. I got a free copy of SUSE Linux in a box from SUSE at their booth. I used it for a little while, but it was so buggy that I uh, wrote up a long list of, of bug reports for them and then tried out Red Hat which I used for a little while, and I switched to Linux Mandrake for several years. These days I'm running Debian. Red Hat Linux t-shirt from back when it was distributed in a cardboard box. There was no Red Hat Enterprise Linux or Fedora, just Red Hat Linux. I got this at a World Wide Web conference in Boston in 1995. In the summer of 1991, my friend from St. Olaf, Mike Hartel, did an internship with the Unix Research Group at Bell Labs in New Jersey. And at the end of the summer, he invited me to visit and see the end of the internship presentations. So I drove up to New Jersey and got a tour of the offices where Unix had been originally developed. And then got to see the presentations of Mike and other interns who were there. I met Dennis Ritchie, Ken Thompson, Bjorn Strostrup, Rob Pike, who demonstrated Plan 9 running on a Gnot terminal for me. I saw Brian Kernahan's office, but he was out that day. A funny story about the Gnot terminals, that was a custom-designed graphical terminal, kind of like a diskless workstation that was part of the Plan 9 system. When one of them broke, they would put a sign on it that said, Gnot working. I saw a recent interview with Ken Thompson, the creator of Unix. He was asked what kind of computer he uses these days, and he said, mostly Raspberry Pis running Linux. He's a practical guy, and he's having fun with home automation and robotics, and those are the perfect tool for him. It's funny to think that the originator of Unix is now running software that I wrote every day. In 1994, after I graduated from the University of Maryland, I got a job at UUNet Technologies. I was working with Kurt Lytle and a group of others, mostly from the University of Maryland, who formed a company within a company at UUNet. Our group was called Pubnix Access Systems and later divided to include the research and development group at UUNet as well. We used the BSDI BSDOS operating system on Digital Equipment Corporation Celebris PCs. 
with 486 and Pentium processors. BSDI was founded and originally headquartered in the UUNet offices, and we funded a lot of the development of BSDOS when we needed some improvements made to the operating system, like adding multiprocessor support without a giant kernel lock. We would send some money that way, and the improvements would arrive in the next version of BSDOS. It gave us a competitive advantage. It was a great partnership. We used BSDOS to create the world's first commercial web hosting service, as well as the first virtual FTP server. Our web hosting platform at UUNet began to use Linux servers in addition to BSDOS once those became a viable option. We hosted some proprietary software which wasn't available for BSD, such as the Real Media or Real Audio servers and early versions of Java. We were originally going to create a dial-up shell access service, but then the web happened and we decided to use our shared Unix hosting platform to build web services. This is a picture of Brad Passwaters, another University of Maryland student administrator, which Dave Sue took a few years later at UUNet using an early digital camera. We were the kind of people who always liked to be tinkering with the latest technology. We got a group together on opening day of Toy Story and went to see it at the theater. That, of course, was the first fully computer-generated feature-length movie. When Mac OS X came out and Macs were finally running Unix, I got an iMac G3 to experiment with, and I've gradually switched to mostly using Macs since then, particularly for content creation. We have a few Windows PCs at home, and I have several computers that run Linux as well. By the early 2000s, I'd started to get tired of fixing bugs and portability issues in what was basically mature software. So I started handing off maintenance of the GNU packages I was responsible for to other people who'd been contributing to them. They've done a fine job since then at maintaining them and adding some additional features like support for SE Linux security enhancements, which came along after my time. They finished the Automake Makefile Generator based on a design I had prototyped and added libtool. One of my daughters has asked me if any of the code I wrote is in Android. I don't think so. It uses a Linux kernel, but not the GNU user land. However, the majority of the servers on the internet are running GNU Linux. Amazon Web Services, the top 500 supercomputers. So it's amazing to think that code I wrote is in most of those. This is an 8-inch floppy disk, like the ones used by the Challenger 3 that I used in high school. This is a 5 and a quarter inch floppy disk, which early IBM PCs used. The Commodore 64 also used five and a quarter inch disks. They're called floppy because they're flexible. This one's almost like a sail compared to hard disks. A hard disk has an aluminum plate and it doesn't flop. This is the Byte Magazine article from November 1987 about AutoConf. These are the copyright assignments for the code that I contributed to the GNU project so that the Free Software Foundation could enforce uh, violations of the GNU General Public License. I transferred my copyright ownership to the Free Software Foundation. So each of these is for a separate program or, or code module, like uh, changes to GNU GetOpt, which I, I co-wrote 
with Richard Stallman. So every time I contributed a new program to GNU, Richard and I had to both sign and date a new agreement for that. This is Volume 1, Issue 3 of Unix World Magazine from 1984. It has an ad for Charles River Data Systems. An ad for Unix from AT&T. An article on AI and Unix. Nothing new there. An article about the new 4.2 BSD release and its performance improvements. This is issue number one of Linux Journal from 1994. Articles include Linux Code Freeze for Linux 1.0 by Linus Torvalds. Articles on what is Linux, what is GNU, the Debian distribution, and an article on the DF command which I wrote, although that's not mentioned. There are a few books that I'm mentioned in. This is the third edition of the new Hacker's Dictionary, edited by Eric Raymond. In the back is a long list of contributors with their email addresses. I'm in there, but I no longer remember which definitions I contributed. I guess that's why it pays to write things down. There's also this book on the auto tools, which I wrote the foreword to. And if you're interested in more reading about the origins of Unix, Linux, and the free software culture, I recommend the book Hackers by Steve Levy, which has a chapter about Richard Stallman on it. The book Unix, A History and Memoir by Brian Kernahan. And two books by Peter Salas, A Quarter Century of Unix and Casting the Net, which is about the origins of the internet. Although I stopped programming video games after high school, in a way, I never did stop. One of the things that attracted me the most to computer programming is that it's like building a virtual world. I loved being able to create something that was orderly, flexible, that made sense, that could bring people together. My work in operating systems brought me that kind of satisfaction and in building larger systems like web hosting platforms or application backends. In a way, it was kind of like building a video game world. It's just a world that had a purpose. It, was, it had a use beyond entertainment. I think that's what attracted me to computer programming. Uh, so it's very satisfying to see that my work on the GNU system has uh, helped so many people. There are surely millions of people each day using software I wrote. As they say about free software programmers, people tend to scratch their own itch. I wrote software that I wanted to, to use. It's satisfying that the virtual world that we built has intersected so powerfully with the real world and changed it and given many people opportunities to do great things of their own.
building on on what we did in the 1980s and 1990s largely a lot of it was just being at the right place at the right time having time and an inclination to solve problems when they were there to be solved and and meeting people who could give me opportunities. I see the Linux and internet revolution as one of those cultural and technological moments that comes once and and will never come again. Uh, kind of like the the cultural changes of the 1960s. The computing industry is much larger and more mature now. There are still lots of opportunities. It's a much bigger pond. It's a lot harder to be a big fish now in a giant ocean. So I'm glad that I was there when I was. Met a lot of wonderful people.